Welcome to NFTs, what every music creator needs to know presented by the ASCAP Lab. The ASCAP Lab is ASCAP's innovation initiative designed to envision and shape the ASCAP and the music industry of the next century, not just that of today or tomorrow. In addition to organizing speaker events like these on strategic topics, the ASCAP Lab also mentors startups through an annual innovation challenge created in partnership with the New York City Media Lab. This year's challenge cohort is focused on music and the metaverse. Finally, the ASCAP Lab also leads other innovation initiatives, both internal and external to the organization. To stay tuned into any of this or to learn about the ASCAP Lab, please visit us at ascaplab.com. While you're there, please be sure to sign up for a mailing list so that you don't miss out on future cutting edge content and updates from the ASCAP Lab. And with that, let's turn it over to Matt Medved, Vicki Nauman, and Pooh Bear to learn about NFTs, what every music creator needs to know. Welcome, and thanks for joining today's ASCAP Experience, ASCAP Lab conversation on NFTs, what every music creator should know. I'm Matt Medved, co-founder and CEO of NFT Now, uh, the premier publication for NFT coverage and curation. Prior to entering NFTs, I spent 15 years at the intersection of music and media as the founder of Billboard Dance and editor-in-chief of Spin Magazine, as well as a DJ producer myself. So I'm really excited to be moderating a discussion that merges two of my greatest passions, NFTs and music. And today I'm thrilled to be joined by two amazing guests, Pooh Bear, Grammy nominated hit making songwriter and producer who is launching his own NFT band and project called Ursa Major, which we'll be discussing more. And Vicky Nauman, founder and CEO of Cross Border Works and a consultant at the intersection of music, tech and licensing rights. Today we are discussing NFTs, what every music creator should know. So let's jump into it. Now, one of the things that I'm always cognizant of is that there is a significant learning curve for NFTs. It can be quite daunting. And so I never assume that anyone uh, already knows the basics. So I figure we should, we should cover those first. So NFT stands for non-fungible token. Um, when I'm talking about fungibility, helping people understand that a token you know, refers to a unique unit of information on the blockchain which is a public ledger of transactions uh, that, that is decentralized and was first pioneered by a, a cryptocurrency you may have heard called Bitcoin. Now, uh, Ethereum is, is sort of the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the leader in the space when it comes to NFTs. And when we think about fungibility versus non-fungibility, the example I always give is, the, is a dollar. So if, if for example, uh, you know, Vicky, if you asked me to borrow a dollar and I pulled out my wallet, you probably wouldn't say, oh, I want that one. You know, you would, it wouldn't really matter which dollar I gave you because they're all the same, right? That's a fungible token. That's the same thing with like a Bitcoin or Ethereum or the US dollar. You know, they're all kind of interchangeable. But an, a non-fungible token is a unique token on the blockchain. So if I rolled up to the event with a Basquiat painting and Vicky rolled up with an Andy Warhol, we don't know just by looking at those, like, what, what their exchange is, right? There are all these other factors at play, like history, artistry, cultural relevance, all of these things that kind of play into figuring out what, this, what, these, unique, uh, what these, these unique assets uh, are worth. And, and, and NFT is essentially a digital version of that. So that's kind of how I dump into it. Vicky, I'm curious to hear too, in the conversations you're having, how are you describing NFTs to people who are just discovering and, and kind of dipping their toes in the water? The way that I'm looking at it is, uh, you know, trying trying to really wrap my heads around all, around all facets of it. But ultimately, one of the issues with music is in the old days, before we went to digital, we, we, we had scarcity. We could only go to the record store and we were only able to buy whatever was found in the bins. And then digital happened, all of the scarcity went away. And what I think, one of the things that I think is so valuable to music is that this reintroduces scarcity. Now it is false scarcity in the sense that someone's deciding to create a certain number of images, you know, and, and not allowing those to just be replicated into, you know, into trillions of versions of it, but it is scarcity. And for music, I think that two really strong pieces of the NFT landscape that apply to music is that in the world of scarcity, you know, music lovers want to collect. We have a long history of collecting t-shirts, saving your ticket stubs from shows, 
getting a, you know, blue vinyl release, and then there's an orange vinyl that comes out next year. And so collectability and scarcity are really, really deeply entrenched in music. And the other is access and that end users want to be part of communities. People who love a particular artist feel like they're in a tribe, they're in a club, they want access to each other, they want access to the artist, they want to help participate in the creation of art. And so when you think of having a scarce asset that you can own and that you can verify it is yours by a hash and by a, you know, a transaction that has occurred on the blockchain, you have an investment in that artist and you have an investment in the future success of that artist and the community's development. And this just to me feels like it brings together so many different pieces of how people naturally engage with music, but it's bringing new technology that actually allows people to say that they own it. And you're kind of getting bragging rights, you know, like to say, I got, I was in on Pooh Bear, you know, I got in on, I got in on this project and you didn't like that, that counts for a lot in our world. I think those are great points, Vicky. And I, I always give the example too. you know, like I grew up, my dad is a huge Beatles fan. You know, he grew up like, like rare Beatles memorabilia and the like. And I always say, it's kind of like a rare signed vinyl, you know, it's like, it, there's a collectible element to it. It doesn't mean that without the music in it, you could go listen to Abbey Road, you know, but, but you could, you know, no, no one's preventing you from listening to Abbey Road. But if you own that signed vinyl of Abbey Road, that has special value, right? That is special value as a collector. And what's amazing, and I think such a great point that you bring up is that it creates access for the first time like it creates this this direct bond between artists and their fans and that direct bond has been really hard to get these days you know with with centralized social media platforms streaming platforms etc um kind of owning the data and owning the point of exchange that's actually a really valuable connection i always say that that an nft sale is a beginning not an end right so you know, now that there's all these opportunities for creators as they go in to really be able to create these direct bonds with their fans, be able to reward their fans, be able to, it's almost like a new age fan club in a sense, where it brings new people in. How should creators that are kind of get, starting to dip their toes in the water at NFTs be thinking about entering the space? What, what, are, what should they be learning about? Um, what should they be keeping in mind? You know, community and authenticity are, are critical. If, you know, if you want to, how you have to think about these things, how are you going to pull your fans, your super fans off of um, or out of Instagram, social media platforms, email lists, you know, your live shows, how are you going to pull them into a community? And then how are you going to interact with them? Because they, you know, you can harness a lot of power when you pull a community together, but you also want to understand what their interests are and let the art and let the projects kind of grow out of that community. So I would put thought into it and, you know, and you don't want the optics of you're just going to sell an NFT for a money grab. That really, I think that you can, it can end up backfiring with the community and it could end up working against you. So think about, think about what kind of art do you want to offer your sound recording? Do you want to do a sound recording that's already released or something new? Do you want to just do art? Do you want to have this be much more about a, you know, some sort of a fan club where you, you know, you have other kind of perks, but you know, when people ask me, well, how do I, how do I get started? Where should I go? I always tell them and, and Pooh Bear and I were talking about this before we got started. So I want to hear his, I want to hear his opinion too, is, um, is, you know, go buy some crypto, you know, go buy some cryptocurrency, buy some, you know, Ethereum, create a wallet, uh, go explore some of the NFT marketplaces, go to Nifty Gateway or Crypto or OpenSea, see what's out there, buy, buy an NFT because we're all making it up as we go. And there are a lot of people in the industry that are messaging me saying, you know, tell us, you know, tell us everything, tell us what's happening. And I'm like, we're just, it's just day to day, every, the landscape changes and we're just rolling with it and we're all trying to figure it out. So there's no harm in asking, there's no dumb questions and there's no harm in just giving it a, giving it a try. 
I love that you said that. I always say there are no dumb questions in NFTs. And uh, I think that you, you hit on a great point. I always advise whenever music musicians hit me up, you know, how should I enter the space? I'm like, start as a collector. It doesn't yeah. need to be something expensive. It doesn't have to be a board ape or whatever. It can be something really small. But the biggest thing is to signal to the community that you're here to create value and not extract value. It's a very significant difference, right? Um, Pooh Bear, I'd love to hear your thoughts too, as a, as an artist who is now making getting ready to enter the space. Uh, yeah. So um, first, you know, this is a a great platform. This is a great you know panel just to be able to to be able to educate and to learn like like you know she said we're learning as we go but i think this is great we need a lot more um panels and and things like this for people to, to just be educated um i think that just you know first and foremost understanding that you know the the money part of it is like it turns into the the least important part of it you know and the art of it becomes you know when I'm just, when Basquiat was painting, he wasn't thinking about money at all. You know, it was just like, I just want to get this idea out of my head, you know? So I think, you know, just for as a creator of music, being able to have the, the freedom, you know, um, to, to move around in a space that's so new, um, it's, it's like almost, it's, um, it's, it's, it's extremely liberating, just um, coming from a music industry that's so controlled, and so, you know, like all the marketing and everything is like you have a marketing team, you have a radio team and you look up and you don't even have your own, like your own fan base or your own, you know, data is what we, we call collecting it. And just now being able to, to create a community and to create, you know, a discord that, you know, people could really, you know, learn and, and become a part from, from the beginning you know, just it, it opens up everything and allows for um, artists who, you know, have kind of felt left out um, of the industry. They now can have a place because, you know, it's, it's a, it, it, you know, you can do something or create a song or create uh, a video or create art. And, you know, it could connect with somebody that you would never think that you would be able to connect with, you know, and, and also I feel like, it's just a great opportunity for people that would never speak to each other in real life, you know, being able to, to come on these discord groups and, and meet and never really being able to cross paths in real life, you know, it's such a, um, a awkward place to, to meet, but it's a great environment and everybody's rooting for each other. Everybody wants each other to win. And it's amazing in an industry where everything's so competitive, it's like now you can build a community and you look up in a month and you can have, you know, 10,000 people that are all on the same page. They all want this project to win because they're a part of it and they understand the significance of it and they understand the longevity of it. And I'm, I'm honestly just, you know, blessed to be a part of the, the beginning of it and not being, you know, not finding out about it two years from now. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think that's such a good perspective. And like one of the one of the examples I always give up is is uh, or, or kind of bring up is is Kevin Kelly's idea of like the what the one thousand true fans, you know, uh, which is a treatise that says. Um, essentially, like in theory, you don't need millions of fans to have a, a successful career as a creative. Um, you know, the original promise of the internet was that you'd be able to reach 1,000, you know, at least like a thousand people around the world who who vibe with what you're doing and want to show up for you. And when I say true fans, I mean they're buying a ticket, they're taking the ride, they're getting the merch, they're showing up to the concert, etc. The issue is like in web two, as we call it, um, you know, all of these centralized platforms kind of got in the way, right? And, and they, you know, all of a sudden as a creator, you had to pay, you know, you had to pay a social media platform to reach even a fraction of your following. And you're kind of stuck as a creator in this likes and comments based economy, um, you know, sort of having to build an audience as a means to an end to middle to, to monetize with brands. But now the, the, um, the exciting thing about NFTs is by creating that direct connection, you're no longer at the mercy of algorithms or ads and all that. 
And, and you can actually do that. And I always say like, if you're an, if you're an up and coming musician and you have 1000 true fans and you put out a music NFT for say a hundred dollars, which is a pretty reasonable price point for an NFT there, that's a hundred thousand dollars in revenue, which is a lot more than a lot of indie artists see from the streaming services. And so just to give an example of how this can be transformative for artists, and we can go into some more examples as we kind of transition, but before we do like Nikki, I'd love to hear your perspective. How can creators sort of get involved? We talked about what are some things that they should keep in mind, but like, if they're ready to take the jump, like how, what does that look like? Yeah. Well, I think they, you know, they need to, you know, they need to think about their fans, what they know about their fans, what kinds of things will their fans likely respond to? Um, and then how, how do you, how do you message them? How do you gather them and let them know that this is happening? And then choosing a platform that you feel works for you. And, you know, you know, I would say, you know, to evaluate if you're, if your fans are, you know, I mean, it is right now, it's still kind of early. And so if your fans are really, really not tech savvy, or there are people who kind of are averse, or maybe, you know, an older demographic or something, you know, you want to think about the whole user experience, what are they, they're going to have to create, they're gonna to have to buy some crypto, and they're going to have to create a wallet. And that isn't, that isn't as easy as creating a new Gmail right now, you know, you have to go through steps, you have to really kind of wrap your head around this, and then you have to take money out of your bank account and go and buy, <laughs> go and buy virtual currency. So think about your audience and what platforms are going to make it easiest and best depending on their level of sophistication. And then I think really, really importantly is set your own objectives of what you want to do. And I think it's so interesting listening to you, Pooh Bear, talk about some of your motivations. And I feel like, you know, we have this digital industry now where in the old days, it, we had containers, we had a three minute song, not because three minutes was the ideal length of a song, but that was because that's what radio wanted to play. And then we had CDs and we had the container of you know, 10 to 15 songs, because that's the amount of storage that was available on the container. Those containers live on in our world now. We're still creating three minute songs, even though some songs are really short and others are, are long, but we're still kind of clinging to these containers of yesterday. And now we don't have, and when you think about an NFT, you don't have a container, you know, it can be, it can be a film, it can be a JPEG of something you created, it could be your lyrics that you wrote, it could be a brand new composition that you're creating with your fans in your discord server. And, you know, you have this creative control, and creative, um, you know, a blank canvas of what you want to do. And think about, you know, what that is, what is the thing that you've always wanted to do, but you've been too constrained by your label or by the way the industry works and, you know, and put that, put that forward with passion. And I think fans will really re respect and honor that. That's a great point, Vicki. I completely agree. And um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll dive into just a couple interesting examples of how we've seen this technology go in the music uh, industry already. As you said, it's very early. It's still not easy to get involved. Like the usability, the UX has so much further to go, but we're already seeing a number of artists doing some really inspiring things. So just to give some examples, and then we're going to turn it over to Pooh Bear and hear a bit more about um, what he's what he's doing with his project and how he got in the space. But, um, you know, one, one name to know in the NFT space is Blau, uh, 3LAU, the, the DJ producer who's also been a real pioneer in music NFTs. Um, you know, he really, as he started to tokenize uh, albums and songs, he also gave that extra access we talked about for one of his drops. He allowed uh, the, the buyer to essentially name the song um, that, that would be included on his upcoming project. He also kind of like bridged the physical and the digital with like physical uh, plaques and, and sort of art pieces accompanying the, those digital uh, side. I think there's, a, and he actually launched a, a company called Royal, which now allows fans to own a percentage of royalties, which is a really powerful thing because it can help turn fans into ambassadors and shareholders. You know, we already see the power of fandom 
when when they don't even own a stake in in what in the artist they're supporting. Now imagine unlocking the potential of ownership there, and and you can actually get like a digital street team of of like you know you think about the organic distribution there, and it, it just built like a really really powerful tightly knit community. So that's a super interesting element. Um, there's an incredible artist named Latasha who actually sold a music video NFT on a platform called Zora for more than fifty thousand dollars, which if you think about it, that's around the same as like a label advance from like an indie label, but she didn't have to give up any of the ownership. And that's what I think is a really powerful, uh, a powerful shift here is that back in the day, if you wanted to really like, you know, if you really wanted to, to make it in pop music, um, you know, there's always a saying, you know, there's not, there's no middle class in music. It's either like the people who have really made it at the top and people who are kind of like, like struggling to make, to make the ends meet and, and, go, and go in day to day. You would you would have to like if you made it to the point where you were about to sign a major label deal, you'd be signing away your masters, 83 percent of your royalties for an advance. But now there's the opportunity to crowdfund those advances yourself. So there's a, a rapper named Ibn Inglor who actually did a ninety two thousand dollar crypto crowdfund for his upcoming album. And he did it while while sharing the ownership with his fans, but a much smaller, much more reasonable percentage of royalties. Um, and so that's, I think, really exciting, too, is seeing how NFTs kind of give artists more leverage. There's just more options as an independent artist than there were prior. Finally, Vicky, I thought you made such a great point on the container side and how NFTs change the, the nature of the creative canvas uh, of, of music release. Um, you know, that's something I found super inspiring when I got into the space, seeing guys like Blau and, and, and RAC do small, like more short form clips and more short form loops, you know, paired with visuals. On the flip side, there's an artist named BT who released a 24 hour song on Super Rare. Now, I don't know any streaming service that's going to play a list of 24 hour song, but clearly it had an audience and it was viable too. So that's super inspiring there. So obviously we're talking about all these cool and inspiring areas where, where this technology is really empowering creators. Pooh Boyer, as a creator yourself, I would love to hear the backstory. How did you first learn about NFTs? How did you get into the space? Um, well, I first learned about NFTs about a year and a half ago. Uh, my friend uh, slash business partner, um, along with me, that's doing Ursa Major, came to me and, and started, you know, telling me about um, the, the crypto punks. And, um, you know, before the, because, you know, they were the, you know, they were the, the ones, the main, the beginners of the, you know, the, the, the mega, the high end uh, NFTs. And I was, I was drawn into it just because I was like, wow, they're really, people are spending this much money on this art. And then I just started doing me like, he's like, yo, well, you know, let's, I'm like, why don't we do a project where, you know, we literally, you know, create animated characters. And, and it just started off with us brainstorming characters. And then um, it, was, it wasn't even bears. It was just like, just animation. We love what the gorillas did in the nineties and how the animation was so, it was so, it was like these gorillas were alive, you know, and, but the music was amazing and nobody ever saw the band for like 10 or 12 years. Like they didn't hit the road till like 12 years later. So, you know, we were like, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Pooh Bear. Um, and he actually, you know, he actually, uh, Sean came up with the, the concept for the constellation Ursa Major. You know, I'd never, I, I, he educated me. I'd never heard of it. And I thought it was fascinating. I'm like, this is perfect. You have stars that create a, a bear image and you have these, a band that, you know, these four different bears from different, you know, um, planets come together to come to earth, you know, to make it as a band. Cause if you can make it in earth, you can make it anywhere in the, in the galaxy. And that's, and then the whole origin story started and, you know, we just, it turned into it, so many different things starting off from just one song and one music video to, no, you know, let's turn this one music video into this ongoing story, you know, a theme um, where, you know, and then we then we, we even, you know, of course, we were like to get everybody really heavily involved. Let's let them share in percentages. And I would love to bring up a, a really good point that most people don't realize when it comes to doing splits and shares and percentages of NFTs or for royalties, it's not simple. It's something that, you know, it's no different than creating a company and doing a reggae, you know, filing to the SEC. It gets deep. It's not, you know, when people say it, it says like, oh, we're just going to give away royalties. And like, no, it's it's a real, it's it's heavy. 
and it's hairy. So, you know, learn, you know, getting into that part of it with our with my attorney and with 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 an attorney, like, how do we do these micro shares where people are involved from the beginning, not just from record sales, not just from streams, not just from merch, but any time Ursa Major makes any money, we want these special, you know, NFT holders, which we're only gonna be a, a small handful of passionate, you know, ones that we want them to share in every form of profit that we make like it, on this whole journey with us. And that's when we, we realized, you know, that, you know, we had to go through the SEC, we had to go through a whole reggae, it's a real process. So I wanted to throw that out there just so that people don't think it's just like, oh, we'll just sit down and, and draw up some splits and, you know, and do micro shares. <laughs> it's not as easy as this sounds. Um, and then um, with, with, with Ursa Major, just, you know, making sure that the, the animation is undeniable. Making sure the music is something that I would like, I love, and I'm brutally honest about because everybody's just dropping NFTs, and they don't want to get left out. And what we wanted to make sure, the reason why we we started, you know, in December, and November, and we haven't dropped anything yet. We just we want this to be special, and we wanted to last. Like we don't want it to be like we don't want it. You know, we just want to build a community and you know relationships with with everybody and make sure that they're engaged and they actually love this the story and a short film that um that's forever evolving and they have say and you know you know which character like you know what they might they might want to hear the, the, the female um tom 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 they might want us to hear like can she sing like, yeah, you know what? She can sing and she's been wanting to go solo. Like there's so many different stories that come from this Ursa Major story. And um, we just like, we're, we want to be the, we're, we're going to be the first in the space to do it. Like everybody's dropping music. Nobody's dropped the animated. I see how they, they're trying to take the board eight characters and, you know, and put the rap songs to them. It's great. Um, we want to really have something that people, like a real story that people love and they understand like, you know, this is not something that we just threw out there and we pumped the brakes on everything because we just want to drop it and we wanted to be special. So, you know, we've been building our discord and just um, more information on just making sure you choose the right platform, you know, cause we started off with speaking with one company, um, you know, and then we went to start to another company and it's just, everybody's excited because it's such a new project and everybody's like, yeah, we want, we want to, we want in, but because it's so new, when it comes time to it, you know, the discord and, and putting together everything that comes along with it, nobody knows what to do. So that's really important is finding uh, um, not just any platform, but a platform that's, you know, really willing to, to learn fast so that they can really support your, your project or they'll just be, you know, trying to take a percentage of something that, you know, that you're, you're, you're passionate about just because they're excited, but they don't really get it and they don't really want to dive into it. So it's really important to, um, to kind of um, go through these companies, these, these, just to pick and see like, you know, which company could support your project the best and the ones that are not just there for the money grab and a quick drop, you know? So um, Ursa Major, you know, we, we, we really want, you know, what we're, we're putting this out for the world to, to come along with us and with real music and maybe even in the future turn the project into an album um and like i said those people that who those people with the shares of you know they're gonna they're gonna earn money you know if the song streams you know 100 million streams you know that's well you know out of 100 million streams is it's not that much money <laughs> unfortunately for songwriters but you know, it adds up and you will, you will be able to see royalties every 30 days and you'll be able to feel like, you know, you're, you're, you're growing and you'll be able to be a part of this experience, not just, you know, enjoying the music, but making money off of it. And um, we're, we're excited about it and game, gamifying, yeah. gamifying, so important to, yeah. to have like these different passages and you get to this one step, like, oh, if you can tell us what school you know, what instrument did this character play in the ninth grade that unlocks this? And the game of the gamification of it, it just turns it into this, you know, it takes you back to a kid again, you know, but there's real rewards, you know, and, and the real utilities that 
that you can really use and they're not like pr promising utilities that sound good but are unrealistic. That's why we're taking our time because we want all our utilities to be so resourceful and so like over the top that it's like, wow, we, we, we don't want to get left out. We don't want to miss out on this experience. I it's love so that. Great. I love the way you're talking about the gamification and ways and just this continually evolving because I do yeah. feel like, you know, with NFTs, once you build a community, once you offer something that there's, you're harnessing so much power and yeah. so much potential and there with the with the pace of change of how everything is evolving right now i mean what we know now of having spotify and apple music and radio and these these existing ways of monetization i feel like i i see no end in sight to the metaverse and other ways that you're going to be able to take these characters that you're developing and put them in virtual worlds and have concerts in virtual worlds and invite your fans. And then you suddenly have this living, breathing entity yes. that can go in, in any direction that you really want to take it. Yes. And the freedom 100%. of not, not having to actually deal with, <laughs> with artists and their ever changing <laughs> personalities and like you know what I don't want to perform today I don't you know just being at being control being in control of these characters is, is amazing and the destiny of it is is endless um and I think we have to be aware that they're creating labels NFT labels by the like by like this like quick 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 and um just being aware of that because it's almost like it's just the music it's just a label again you know and it's like we don't want to get, you know, we, we have so much freedom right now. And then you have, you have like these companies now that are multi-billion dollar tech companies. And they're like, oh, whoa, we'll just be an NFT label and we'll just give X amount of dollars. And then next thing you know, your likeness is gone. It's back again to the music industry again, you know? So we, we have to be real careful about, it's coming fast. Like I, every day I'm getting, we're getting offers from NFT labels. Like, yo, we'll, we'll pay you this much for Ursa Major. And I'm like, whoa, like this is getting scary because like now the, like now the people who were like sleeping on it, the tech giants, they're like, oh, we have, we have enough money to come in and just buy these people basically. And we just got to be aware of that and, and try to keep our, you know, just, you know, somehow keep it, you know, keep it, let, you know, they, they come in, they come in and do their thing. But at the same time, we have to keep it community based and keep, keep our, you know, keep it decentralized, you know, absolutely it's really important. Absolutely. I think you raise great points, Pooh Bear, there too. You know, it's, it's interesting, just even anecdotally for me, from my experience in the music industry, I remember back in 2016, 2017, trying to like, was writing about crypto, at, like in blockchain and music. And it was hard to get a lot of people in the music industry to really pay attention. But now they, I think, I think there's been like a real like clarion call, like, like the music industry realizes it can no longer afford to ignore this technology. That doesn't mean necessarily understands it fully, but, but, but there's definitely things are evolving rapidly. And, you know, Vicky, I'd love to hear your perspective as someone who is consulting with businesses and, and and different entities in the music industry like how are you seeing those conversations go like how has the traditional music industry kind of responded to this and how are how is their understanding and approach to this technology evolving well it's it is it is definitely evolving and i have long been an advocate i mean i bought i bought bitcoin in 2011 and i thought i was i thought i was really late you know, and so I thought, I thought, oh man, I really missed it because other people I knew had bought it when it was like, you know, $4 a, a coin and I got $600. But, um, but I remember in those early days with, with, with blockchain there, you know, there was a lot of, you know, kind of traditional industry people poking around, calling me and saying, what do you think about blockchain? And, and I've always maintained, I think the permanence of data has, value because of how rights change and, you know, transactions, but we don't necessarily want to run a Spotify like service on the blockchain because transactions are slow and they're expensive and they're, you know, and then there's all the environmental concerns, but data, I think there's, there's value there. 
Um, and I think that we just haven't quite had the perfect use case for blockchain for music. A lot of companies, you know, originally thought, oh, we're going to completely disintermediate labels and publishers. We will no longer have any of them. And I'm like, no, that is, that is definitely not going, <laughs> it's definitely not going to happen because labels and publishers provide a really valuable service. Um, and so I don't think that blockchain is necessarily the place to try to disintermediate people. I think it's really an enabling technology and with NFTs and all of these things that I see are being very artist driven and very artist centric, that it is, it is kind of requiring an almost like a paradigm shift because traditional rights holders oftentimes think of, of the world in terms of their catalog and how can their catalog be made available to a platform on a licensing basis. And I feel like the ship has sailed. I don't see anyone in the metaverse, whether it's you know, gaming, AR, VR, NFTs, decentralization, fractionalization, nobody wants 60 million songs in any of that. It's about an artist and bringing an artist's vision to life. And then the label and the publisher have to kind of shift their thinking a little bit and say, okay, these are artists led. And now we need to either enable that or we need to get out of the way and let the artists do what they want to do creatively. And, um, and I did a like I did a project in the fall for a company that was really trying to wrap their head around the creator economy and Web3. And I talked to lots of people and some of the traditional labels and publishers said things to me like, I don't know how we're going to participate in any of this because all we know how to do is make a record. And I thought, well, that probably isn't enough. You know, so you have you're going to have to do some digging and some, put some different lenses on. And there's I believe there's room for everyone in Web3, but it may not all look the same as what we know now. And I even think about things like who should have the wallets should the in our current world, if I'm licensing music, I'm licensing the master and the publishing from the label and the publisher. But in an NFT world, is that right? You know, would the would the label and the publisher have wallets, or shouldn't the composer and the performers have the wallets? And then, do the composers and the performers are they then obligated to pay the the labels and the publishers? I don't know. I really don't know. But these are the kinds of things that I think we have to we have to sort out. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, we're so so very early in this education process. And there's there's a lot of misconceptions still around NFTs. Um, one of the ones that that's gotten a lot of a lot of uh, press, you know, is the environmental impact. And I know that there have been a lot of uh, sensationalist headlines, to put it lightly, around that that kind of misunderstand some of the some of the elements of the technology. The fact that, like, for example, Ethereum has a fixed energy consumption, so uh, act, it'll actually have the same carbon footprint whether NFTs existed or not on it. Um, and you know, the actual carbon footprint of it is, is you know, like roughly like 0.02% of our total CO2. It's about the same as one big tech company. And so there's a lot of like, but even still, there's still the perception that, that of, of, you know, the, of sort of like the environmental impact. And that's something that artists have had to navigate as they've done drops and like to make sure that they're not, um, you know, you know, running afoul of their fan bases. And there are some other blockchains like Tezos and Solana that have uh, much, much smaller, almost carbon, carbon neutral footprints. I'm curious, Pooh Bear, like, was that an, was that a factor uh, that you weighed when you were deciding your project? And I'm curious to hear Vicky your take as well. Um, that that definitely I, I'm not going to sit here and say that that we thought about that part of it, um, the energy part of it. Um, it that it's just so many different things that you know are way that are way worse for the environment than you know, the mining Bitcoins and, you know, like just using that energy. So we, we definitely didn't think about that at all. Um, we just, you know, honestly, we just wanted to create a project that we loved. We, we definitely didn't think about that where that's, it's, that's a real great point. Um, and we understand I'm in other businesses where that is the most important, you know, or my water business, the, you know, the recycle, you know, being sustainable, all of that stuff is important, but I, we definitely didn't think about that. Um, 
while um, creating uh, Ursa Major. I do feel like we're we're all trying to understand, you know, our overall what you know what we can individually do. And I'm you know I'm you know terrible in the sense that I dutifully take out my recycling and you know, and try to buy glass bottles instead of plastic, but then I'm flying on planes all over the world. And so, you know, I, exactly. you know we're all trying to figure it out. And to. I, but I do think that it's really important that, that this is being surfaced and discussed because it really is for most of these problems. I mean, for consumers, yes, we need, we absolutely need to be mindful of this and artists, I think need to think about their fans but I also feel like most of these environmental issues are industry and they are industry and there have to be enough regulatory pressures as well as consumer pressures to come up with solutions that are going to be more palatable. You know, it doesn't make sense with what we know now about energy use and climate to embark upon, you know, the new coal Um but I feel like we're still in such, such early days that that is just, you know, one issue of many that I think we, you know, this is kind of like, it's kind of like the 2000 to 2003, or maybe 99, 98 to 2003 of that informative days of the internet as we know it now, where it was largely, you know, crashes and burns and proofs of concept and crazy things that were not real business models, but they, they proved that people were interested in engaging with the internet. And that's kind of where we are with all of these things now is we're trying to figure out proof of concepts, what the issues are, and then, you know, how we resolve this and make it more sustainable for the future. For sure, for sure. And, you know, as we kind of draw things to a close, I think a final question too, you know, Vicky, I know that you're, uh, you know, very experienced on, on like the, on the music rights and the licensing side. And how are you thinking about like that in, in the context of, of NFTs and, and blockchain and, and protecting like artists, uh, IP, um, while, while still also like encouraging kind of like a, a fruitful, uh, like, and, and like open creative, like landscape in the industry. Yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of gray area and, you know, everything from, you know, who gets the wallets to how do you enforce a smart contract and, you know, what happens if something goes awry? I'm really fascinated by the, the length to which you Pooh Bear have gone to create this fractionalization and be able to then take all of the revenues and put them back through for the community. Um, I do feel like, you know, there is a almost any time a new technology crashes into the music industry, there's usually most of the people on the technology side have no idea how complicated music rights work. I actually talked with a couple companies when I was at South by Southwest, they showed me what they were building and what they wanted to do in the metaverse. And I was just like, let me save you a thousand steps and a lot of pain. And let me explain to you how music rights work and how there's master and publishing and the artist usually doesn't control those if they're a significant artist. And you can't just assume that artists are going to bring all these rights to the table. And if you're the platform that's making them available, the liability is yours. And they looked at me like, this woman is insane. You know, like she can't, she just can't be right. <laughs> And, um, and so I think, you know, we, we're, we're going to be going through lots and lots of discussions. I think there are revenue model issues that need to be sorted out. Who should get, who should get compensated in this? I believe that there's plenty of room for, you know, writers, performers, publishers, labels, all to do, you know, to participate in this. But it's, you know, we have problems around rights and data and licensing in our Web2 world. And those things are no, nowhere near being resolved. And so that, you know, we're going to, co we're going to have these coexisting problems in Web2 and live opportunities in Web3. And we have to figure out bridges. And it doesn't, you know, I'm not seeing that 
every artist who's ever rec re recorded something or every writer who's ever composed a song needs or will ever need to put all, everything out as an NFT. But I feel like creating some standards and creating some generally accepted practices and guidelines around how to do this from a share perspective and then how do you settle crypto with lots of big publicly traded companies can't accept crypto. So then you have to settle, convert to fiat and do that off chain. Um, we've got a lot of, we've got a lot of work to do, but that's also why I think artists who are getting their managers and their creative teams and their lawyers around are helping to light, shine a, a light on a path that other artists can follow. That's a great, great point, Vicky. And, and, and Pooh Bear, I'd love to hear your perspective on that as an artist yourself. Yeah, I, I, that's great. Great job, Vicky. I, I really just feel like, you know, even though it's so new, like I have these conversations with my, my publishing. I don't have a publishing deal. I have an admin deal. Just, you know, it's where I am where they, you know, they just collect from me. But it, even in that sense, I still know that, you know, they, these, they're going to have to figure out how to monetize. They're going to have to figure out how to make some money off of these NFTs. You know, it's, it's, only, it's only fair. So in my conversation, you know, with my, my, you know, my admin you know, company, you know, is, you know, if I make X amount of dollars off of this project, then I'm going to personally just take this amount and put it towards my admin, you know, my admin deal, you know, and there, because there aren't any rules, there's nothing in my, my, my admin deal that says, oh, if you make an NFT, um, then we, we share in this amount. And so that, that it raises a lot of concerns for publishers and, and labels. But for me, I just got ahead of it and was like, you know what? If I make X amount of dollars from this, I got, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this amount and put it towards my admin deal just because I feel like eventually this is what's going to have to happen anyway. And I always, I feel like, like Vicky said, there's enough room for everybody to make money off of it, especially for the people who originally, you know, believed in you yeah. that, you know, that took chances and, and did give you a crazy advance, you know, now what are they, they, now they can't, you know, recoup their money because the, the NFT is the new way to make money now. So it's like, I was like, I was like, I mean, I'm going to go a step ahead and I'm going to create what hopefully I'll be able to be a part of creating in the new NFT publishing company you know, that makes sense for everybody. And it is in favor of the creator, the writer, and it's not the other way around. Um, but, you know, just making sure everybody is compensated that that has invested money in, into you as an artist or a writer, we can't forget about those people. You know, we can't just be like, all right, this is our way to just make all the money. And, you know, we can't be greedy like that. We have to keep an open mind and remember the people that believed in us. And, and just... Um, just keep learning and at the same time, you know, understanding how to use this, not just, you know, just how to use it, just not for money, man. And it's so easy for people to just look at it like, oh, I could just drop this and take all this money as opposed to like, let me build a community because with a community, you know, it's in, it's, there's this infinite amount of things that you can do and so much as opposed to like, you know, everybody looking at you like, oh, man, you just took all our money and bought a board eight with our money or you just took all our money and bought another NFT, you know, as you know, and just letting people be along for the, the long, the long run of it. And just showing, you know, that there it's just there's just another route. You know, I think that for curators, it's so liberating to finally have a, a, a new form of transportation to get our 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 art out to the world and to connect it to people that we would never be able to meet in real life. Um, and with that, and in the same breath, you know, figuring it out as we go and making sure nobody's left out, like the people that really deserve, you know, to participate in it outside of the community, making sure, you know, those, those companies, the publishers and those labels, they're not, the, they're not the enemy as much as people like to paint labels to be the bad guys. I still, I still believe in major labels. I, I believe in independent labels. I believe in streaming services. I just think, you know, over time, everything needs to correct itself, you know, but um, I feel like everybody's supposed to, to share in this, this process. And I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it, you know, and, and to get 
you know, get music out there and, and get new projects out there in this new way. Love that. Love that. And, you know, we could, we could easily do another hour you know, right? diving deep. This, <laughs> I always say with NFTs, the rabbit holes are endless, but uh, yeah. I think that well, that'll wrap today's discussion. One, you know, this space moves really quickly. I always say weeks are months and months are years in the NFT space. So next year, when we meet again, same time, same space, I'm sure everything will have changed and it'll be a whole new paradigm as well. I'm looking forward to it. But in the meantime, thanks to both of you. Thank you to everyone who joined today. This has been a great discussion.